In the shadowy backdrop of Moscow Stud Farms lurked a chilling predator by the name of Sergei Golovkin, known terrifyingly as the Fisher or the Boa. This farm worker concealed a monstrous alter ego beneath his unassuming exterior. With a preference for teenage males, Golovkin cunningly ensnared his victims, subjecting them to horrifying abuse and torture within the confines of his garage turned dungeon. As the death count escalated, a nation helplessly held its breath. This is one of the most horrific cases I've covered hands down. There's so much that went on and it just keeps getting worse. But before we dive in, I just want to say that I make videos weekly. So if you want to see my next one, please drop the video a like and subscribe if you are new. It really helps me out. Thank you. Sergei Golovkin was born on November 26th. 1959 in Moscow during the era of the Soviet Union. His mother, a homemaker, was notably introverted and a self-possessed individual. She dedicated the majority of her time to domestic chores and her precious free time was often spent in solitary activities such as reading or indulging in arts and crafts. However, she was not often involved with her family and displayed an arrogance that required others to seek her attention vigorously. This trait was something she and Golovkin's father shared. On one hand, Golovkin's father was more open and approachable, yet this was marred by his addiction to alcohol. His frequent inebriation often resulted in violent actions towards his family. With both parents being strong, negative influences within the family, there were often severe conflicts between them, creating a hideous domestic environment. Golovkin was a sick child growing up. He had a congenital defect in his sternum a condition that led to frequent bouts of bronchitis and indigestion. He was further troubled by reoccurring intestinal infections, as well as enuresis, which is an uncontrollable urge to urinate. This condition frequently led to bedwetting and soil clothes. Yet, his father dismissed the necessity of medical treatment opting instead for what he felt would work. This included dousing him with cold water or making him get cold baths. But far from providing relief, these unconventional methods only incited Golovkin's disgust and anger, instilling in him a deep-seated hatred for bathing that persisted well into his adulthood. In fact, as an adult, Golovkin would not wash with water and obviously had foul smells about him. It was these struggles growing up that led Golovkin to become an introvert during his formative years. He chose solitude over the risk of his classmates potentially detecting the odour of his urine and being mocked and bullied. Even more significantly, the absence of a nurturing bond between Golovkin and his parents further solidified his sense of isolation. In his family, affectionate gestures such as hugs and kisses were rare. There were no comforting bedtime stories, no child's play. When Golovkin's father wanted to teach him something new or wanted to instill discipline, his approach was blunt crude and often forceful, escalating at times to physical abuse with fists or a belt. As a result of his familial circumstances and health issues, Golovkin transformed into an exceedingly quiet and reserved child who favoured solitude. 
He was actually a good student at school, intelligent, but his self-confidence was terrible, which got even worse as facial acne kicked in during his teenage years and he grew tall and lanky and developed a slouch. He did not trust anyone, not even his parents, and he had no friends to turn to. Upon entering his teenage years, Golovkin began to engage in self-gratification, a natural part of growing up. However, fueled by his paranoia, he thought his classmates were aware of his actions, which caused him great anxiety. Although his orientation was never fully clear, Golovkin claimed to have fantasized over the girls in his class. These issues were never talked about in school, and a very basic education was given. He obviously never spoke to any of these girls in this way, but his fantasies began to fester. At this time, he was watching videos on World War II, and he became obsessed with the torture and sadistic nature of the murders that took place. This started to change his own fantasies, he started imagining that he was forcing himself on the girls in the class and then torturing them. He would also fantasize about the males being in a frying pan, naked and screaming in pain as they burned. Another reoccurring fantasy was burning his classmates at the stake and slashing words and profanities into their chests. Psychologically, he was becoming a very dangerous individual, but so far, he had not put any of these fantasies into practice. When he was 13 years old, Golovkin found a stray cat on the streets. He captured it, with the intentions of taking it home and committing chilling cruelty. He hung the helpless animal, and later confessed that observing the cat's struggle in its final moments, granted him a perverse form of pleasure. He described feeling relaxation and a release of tension, achieving a sense of, and quote, spiritual relief. He then went on to sever the poor animal's head, arms and legs. After this attack, he said that he felt the urge to exhume bodies from the graveyard and cut off the limbs. This was not the only act of cruelty against animals. He would also pour boiling water into fish tanks to see how they would react, pouring in bits at a time until the fish could not withstand the heat. Brutal. He was not cruel to all animals though. He shared a strong but unusual bond with horses. Amidst the loneliness of his life, he found solitude in their company. Near where he grew up, he tended to these animals, rode them, and was intent on learning as much as he could about them. This led to him enrolling in an evening class, undeterred by his father's disparaging remarks, who was saying things like, it wasn't manly and it was foolish. His commitment to understanding these animals saw him studying at the equestrian school at the Timarares Academy. This was a period where his life became fully devoted to horses. Despite remaining a loner amongst his peers, he did make one friend, a girl, but their relationship was purely platonic. By this time, his interaction with women mirrored the cold, emotionless relationship he shared with his own mother. The fantasies that captivated him by this time were violent and with a predatory nature. In the final week of Golovkin's studies, a transformative event occurred that proved to be a catalyst in his life. Golovkin encountered a group of teenage boys who demanded money from him. When he was unable to meet their demands, they assaulted him viciously. He suffered serious head injuries, lost teeth and a broken nose. The aftermath of this traumatic episode gave birth to an intense yearning for revenge, 
Despite his efforts, he was unable to locate his assailants. Over time, this personal vendetta evolved into a broader, more disturbing, sadistic impulse, targeting boys aged between 12 and 16. Those he thought symbolized his attackers. He would also want to act out his fantasies that he had been having in the classroom with these boys. This was a chilling progression, signaling his escalating potential for violence. In 1982, Golovkin completed his studies at the academy and secured a position as a livestock expert at the first Moscow stud farm, located in the Odinstovo district. His proficiency in this role and his contributions to the advancement of horse breeding was so significant that he was awarded a silver medal at the 1989 trade show. However, his personal life painted a far darker picture. In his free time, Golovkin would stroll near pioneer camps and children's institutions. His mind filled with sinister thoughts of finding someone to punish. In the summer of 1982, Golovkin decided to make his dark fantasies a reality. During a stroll in a forest, he started a conversation with a boy he came across. However, the boy sensed something was amiss and he managed to flee. Although the interaction was fleeting, it left Golovkin with a rush and he was eager to try again. Learning from this experience, Golovkin decided to attack his victims without warning. Not long after, in the same forest, he came across a boy of about 14 picking mushrooms. Golovkin attempted to strangle him, but again, the boy escaped. This encounter, again, gave Golovkin great satisfaction and he was eager to persist with his attacks. In his workplace, Golovkin was faring remarkably well. The female co-workers at the farm found his awkwardness somewhat endearing, eliciting feelings of sympathy. They'd often assist him with meals and errands, and in a turn of unsuspecting trust, they even entrusted their children to him. Golovkin had a knack for engaging with the young visitors who came to the farm, entertaining them with tales about the animals, predominantly the horses. Unconventionally, he also allowed them to observe the insemination procedures of the mares, a practice that might have seemed strange to many. Golovkin often did the insemination of the mares, and it used to freak his co-workers out. He would put on a specially made glove to do the procedure, and during the process, his eyes would glaze over, and he would become unresponsive. He would hold his arm inside the mare for much longer than was needed, almost like he was filling some void within his own frustrations of his desires. Although it freaked out his co-workers, they were unaware of how deviant Golovkin really was. Golovkin spent his free time wandering the woods and spying on the teenagers, planning potential attacks. What is most alarming is that no one had any idea what he was up to. In 1984, the perfect opportunity came. His name was Andre K, a 14-year-old. He was at a pioneering camp, and without permission, he had snuck out of class to go for a smoke on his own. Andre said, Suddenly, I felt that someone was touching my shoulder. An unknown young man in a green wind jacket. He took out a knife and threateningly tied my hands behind my back, put something on my head, possibly a cap, and said to go to the forest if you want to live. He put a knife to my stomach and ordered me to lie face down. I don't remember what happened next. A harrowing incident took place when Andre found himself at the mercy of Golovkin. 
Once Andre was on the ground, Golovkin tied a rope around his neck and suspended him from a nearby tree. Stunned and terrified, Andre did not fight back or resist. Golovkin then indulged in his perverse satisfaction as he watched Andre's life ebb away. After assuming Andre was deceased, Golovkin lowered his body to the ground, leaving him there. However, Andre was not dead. He had survived the brutal assault and miraculously managed to find safety. After a month-long recovery in the hospital, he made a full recovery from his traumatic ordeal. In the aftermath of Andre's survival, Golovkin was filled with a toxic mix of fury and self-loathing. He berated himself for his perceived failure and for the mistakes he felt he had made. The fact that his victim had survived and might expose him filled him with terror. His fear though wasn't merely about the prospect of punishment, but also the exposure of his true self, a brutal, violent predator. His self-worth plummeted as he grappled with his inability to accomplish his horrendous deeds. He found himself at a crossroads. He contemplated abandoning his violent attacks altogether. The fear of discovery and the shame of his actions gnawed at him, causing him to reconsider his path. Despite the overwhelming fear and self-doubt, Golovkin decided to take a new approach. He aimed to coax his victims into a vulnerable state, almost seduce them, very different from his usual violent tactics. And it wasn't long before he found a potential target, a 17-year-old male. Golovkin invited him back to the farm and tried to earn his trust, but he manipulated the situation, plying him with alcohol until both of them were heavily intoxicated. Back at Golovkin's residence, he helped the inebriated youth to bed. As night settled in, Golovkin made his move. He tried to force himself on the young man, but the teenager woke up and strongly rejected him. The young man even mocked Golovkin, which deeply humiliated him. For the following months, Golovkin was haunted by the fear of being arrested. His mental state was fragile, and he even contemplated ending everything. Yet as the days passed and no repercussions surfaced, his fear began to subside. With each passing day, his confidence returned. He had gotten away with his actions once again. This realization empowered Golovkin, emboldening him to return to his vicious cycle of attacking and preying on new victims. That fateful evening, he arrived at Katwa train station, located in a district of Moscow. As he ambled through the nearby forest, a 16-year-old male riding a bicycle caught his predatory eye. The young man was Andre Pavlov, a boy who cherished the simple joys of visiting his grandparents and collecting tree sap, a wholesome activity that he often indulged in. Unfortunately, this would be the last time he would do so. As Andre stopped for a smoke break, Golovkin stealthily trailed him through the woods. This was the opportunity he had been waiting for. With Andre unsuspecting, Golovkin pounced, transforming an ordinary day into an unimaginable nightmare. As Golovkin approached Andre, he pulled out a knife and tied his hands together with some rope. He led him deeper into the woods. Once out of sight, Golovkin forced himself on Andre. Then, he took some rope and strangled him near to the point of losing consciousness. But just before this happened, he stopped and let him come around before stabbing him in the throat. Andre died a horrific death that no one should have to endure. Once he passed, 
Golovkin attacked the body further, repeatedly stabbing the neck, chest, and genitals. The body of Andre was later found by his father of all people, but there was no evidence of the killer. There was only a sighting of a tall, dark-haired man with bad acne. Golovkin had finally completed what he had desired to do for so long, but terrifyingly, he was just getting started. Just a few weeks after his first attack, on the 12th of May 1986, Golovkin once again found himself craving to act on his disturbing fantasies. This time, he set his sights on a familiar face, a 12-year-old boy named Alec, known to Golovkin through their shared interest in horse riding. Golovkin decided to entice young Alec into a secluded area of the woods, promising the allure of hidden treasure. Excited by the prospect of finding a hidden bounty, Alec followed him where he wanted, into the dense forest. Once sufficiently hidden from any prying eyes, Golovkin bound Alec's hands and propped him onto a tree stump. Preparing to act out his murderous intent, suddenly wary, Golovkin questioned Alec about whether he had mentioned their secret meeting to anyone else. Alec, perhaps sensing something amiss, lied and said that he told their mother about their rendezvous. This claim, whether truth or fabrication, made Golovkin pause. Fearful of discovery, he decided against proceeding with his dark plans. Alec's life was spared that day, and both returned from the woods unscathed. But Alec would be the last person to escape the clutches of Golovkin. In the summer of 1986, a sense of joy and anticipation filled the air as children from all over started to arrive for their annual retreat at the summer camps near Moscow. Unbeknownst to them and their parents, a dark shadow loomed over their anticipated season of fun and adventure. On July 11th, 14-year-old Andre Goliath mysteriously vanished and the mood at all the camps turned dark. Golovkin had used his usual techniques, something he was really refining by this point. He had been watching the teenagers from the bushes, and when Andre got close to the fence, this is when Golovkin pounced. He pulled out a knife and led Andre deep into the woods, to a place he had pre-planned. Golovkin forced himself on Andre and then proceeded to hang him. Golovkin would later state that he took pleasure in seeing the fear in his victims, watching them struggle. He was truly horrific. Not satisfied with this death, he continued. He removed the genitalia and placed it in a plastic Ziploc bag. He proceeded to open the chest cavity and let all the organs fall out. Still not getting the feeling he desired, he brought the body down from the tree and started to stab the body all over in a rage. He beat the remains and completely separated the head from the body to keep as a souvenir. As he was walking away from the crime scene, he quickly changed his mind and tossed the severed head not far from the body. The victim was found the next day by mushroom collectors. Officers were shocked by the gruesome discovery and how much violence the crime scene contained. The case of Andre's mysterious disappearance captured the attention of the highest level of law enforcement. Yevgeny Bakin, a senior investigator for particularly important cases, was appointed to spearhead the investigation, along with Vladimir Kostarov, the head of the main criminal investigation department. These seasoned officers, known for their meticulous approach and keen investigative skills, threw themselves into the task at hand. 
working to crack the case and bring the person responsible to justice. While the investigation was operating at full throttle, Golovkin, alarmingly observant and calculating, receded deeper into obscurity, leaving no traces of his illicit activities. His evasive maneuvers were further aided by the emergence of rumors that attributed the killings to an elusive figure known as the Fisher. These rumors allegedly originated from a friend of Andre's, the last victim, but none of it could be confirmed for certain. Some whispered that Andre and his friend had bumped into a man who called himself the Fisher, while others claimed it was a man who had a tattoo on his hand which said the Fisher. With a lack of substantial leads, the authorities took this sliver of information and used it as a focal point for their investigation. Golovkin, covertly observing these developments from the shadows, was intrigued by the rumours swirling in the press. He even developed a certain fondness for the alias, the Fisher. As law enforcement officers searched for Golovkin from 1986 to 1989, he seemingly returned to a normal life. Yet, behind this facade of normality, his sinister plotting continued unabated. Golovkin concluded that carrying out his crimes in the woods was too risky. The need for a safer method was growing more evident. Around this time, Golovkin purchased a beige colored car and acquired the right to own a garage on the stud farm. His original intent for the garage was innocent, storing items like potatoes in pickles. However, his reality was far from innocent and with the looming threat of the police closing in on the killer, Golovkin knew that he had to be more cautious. That's when the terrifying idea took hold. He could transform his garage into a macabre dungeon, a chamber specifically designed for his sadistic pleasure. He would later state, I wanted to torture the boys for a long time, and painfully, as I saw in my fantasies. I wanted to see their humiliation, to hear their pleas for mercy. Golovkin meticulously prepared his horrific sanctum, concreting the floor and lining the walls with concrete slabs. He installed iron rings with these walls, purposely designed for restraining his victims. In this chilling preparation, he even bought a baby bath with the gruesome intention of collecting blood. I prepared thoroughly, said Golovkin. During this period, Golovkin altered his victim profile. His attention remained on teenage boys, but now he specifically sought out those who were runaways. He understood that the parents of such boys would not immediately commence a search giving him a larger window to carry out his horrific acts. In August of 1990, he identified a 15-year-old boy named Sergi. Golovkin had encountered him near one of the Moscow train stations, an environment that was populated with transient and runaway youth. Golovkin lured Sergi into his trap, bringing him back to his newly prepared grizzly lair the converted garage. Golovkin forced himself repeatedly on Sergi. He then burned the hair on his body with a blowtorch, strangled him with huge gloves used in the artificial insemination of horses. He then hung him, dismembered him and ate parts of his body, cooking the flesh with a soldering iron. He buried the remains of Sergi in the forest but he kept his skull to use as a device to scare future victims and let them know what awaited them. Golovkin's strategy evolved over time, becoming more targeted and methodical. He would identify boys hitchhiking on the road and propose a joint criminal act, such as robbery 
or shoplifting. Those who agreed were deemed suitable victims, fitting the profile of the young troublemakers who assaulted him back in his university days. These encounters served to fuel Golovkin's perverse sense of justice. He believed that by eliminating these boys, he was purging the world of potential criminals. Those who refused his criminal proposal were instantly dismissed, as they did not align with his deeply ingrained teenage tormentors from his past. In this way, Golovkin self-servingly justified his heinous acts, while simultaneously being able to externalize his internal hatred onto his victims. The location of the garage relative to the farm was critical to Golovkin's operations. To ensure that his colleagues did not spot him with the victims, he would instruct the boys to climb into the trunk of his car. This extra measure further helped to maintain his dual life and conceal his grim secrets from those around him. And with the young men believing that they were committing a crime, they were willing to get into the boot with no suspicions. During this horrifying period, from August 1990, Golovkin claimed the lives of another eight boys, aged between 10 and 16. In two chilling instances, he even kidnapped pairs of boys simultaneously, subjecting them to his torment. Around this time, the local community was becoming increasingly alarmed as the count of the missing boys in the Ondinsovo district soared, with around 50 unaccounted for. Additionally, the grim discovery of dismembered bodies was becoming distressingly common. Even though not all these disappearances and brutal murders could be attributed to Golovkin, the grim situation nonetheless demanded he exercise an even greater level of caution to avoid detection. His horrifying routine continued. Due to his preferred method of murder, strangulation, he got another nickname, the Boa. Golovkin would later admit, I almost love them. The more I liked them, the more I wanted to manipulate it. Cut more, cut. These chilling words painted a dark picture of a twisted obsession and a perverse pleasure in their suffering. On September 15th, 1992, Golovkin selected his next set of victims, three boys whom he was acquainted with, Yuri Sidikin, Bledislav Sharikov, and Denisy Frimov. Due to being familiar with him, the boys felt no apprehension when Golovkin proposed they go to work, meaning rob some cigarettes from a warehouse. However, Golovkin was oblivious to the fact that there was a fourth boy who had momentarily stepped away to use the bathroom when he arrived. Upon returning with their friend, the boys explained the plan to him and urged him to join them. The fourth boy, however, declined their invitation, stating that his parents would be concerned if he was not home. Accepting his decision, the three boys returned to Golovkin, climbed into his car, one in the trunk and two in the back seat, obscured by a blanket. What they didn't realize was that Golovkin was not taking them to a warehouse, but rather his torture chamber. Once they arrived at the garage, the boys initially shown some reluctance, but Golovkin calmed their fears by telling them that they needed to go inside to get some tools so they could go to work. Once they were all ensnared within the confines of the lair, Golovkin revealed the horrifying truth. He asked if they had heard of the notorious Fisher before. Then, chillingly, declared that they were destined to become his next victims. Terror-stricken, the boys desperately pleaded for their lives, promising Golovkin that they would lure others to his chamber if he would only spare them. Tragically, 
their pleas only served to further wet Golovkin's perverse appetite for their fear. Their fate was irrevocably sealed. Golovkin revealed the monstrous depth of his sadism during his recounting of the atrocities he committed. He relished the perverse power he held over the boys, informing them of the grim tally of his victims that would result from their deaths. He went on to outline the chilling order in which they would meet their ends. Golovkin had a preference for Freemov, and this perversely meant he had a desire to prolong the boy's terror. Golovkin wanted him to witness the horrors that awaited him, hoping to savour his growing dread. The first to suffer was Sidikin. Golovkin subjected him to cruel physical torment and forced himself repeatedly on him, before ultimately hanging him in front of his terrified friends. Next came Sharikov. He got the same treatment as Sidikin. It was almost like a routine. Golovkin then forced him onto a chair with a noose around his neck. In a sick twist, Golovkin made Firmov kick the chair from under Sharikov, directly implicating him in his friend's death. In a grotesque display of brutality, Golovkin dismembered Sharikov's lifeless body right before Firmov's eyes. He coldly explained the autonomy of the internal organs as he was dissecting, deriving a perverse satisfaction from Freemov's helpless horror. Despite his circumstances, Freemov managed to maintain a semblance of composure, only occasionally averting his eyes from the unspeakable scene unfolding before him. Then came Firmov's turn. Golovkin submitted him to the same routine as his two friends, but he went a little further with him. Golovkin said, and quote, I told Firmov, who was hanging on a hook, that I would now burn an obscene word onto his chest with a blowtorch. During the burning, Firmov did not scream, only hissed in pain. Upon discovering the dismembered bodies, authorities sprung into action, relentlessly questioning the friends and acquaintances of the victims. It was during these interrogations that they encountered the fourth boy, the one who had declined Golovkin's sinister invitation. This chance encounter would prove to be Golovkin's downfall. The boy knew Golovkin, his vehicle and his ominous last minute proposition to join him. With this crucial piece of information, police could finally tie Golovkin to the gruesome murders. Sergei Golovkin was arrested on October 19th, 1992. Initially, he believed that there was no evidence against him. He was calm and feign in shock and remain in silent in the face of the authorities' relentless questioning. During the night, Golovkin's paranoia got the better of him and he believed the authorities might know something, so he tried to end it all, but he was unsuccessful. The police managed to get a search warrant and went to Golovkin's garage. The scene that greeted the authorities was straight out of a nightmare. The dank, grimy basement was smeared with dried blood all over the walls clear evidence that the monstrous acts had been committed within. With the horrifying reality of his crimes on full display, Golovkin's demeanour shifted dramatically. The once silent and seemingly innocent suspect now seemed to revel in recounting his heinous actions. His words were chillingly matter-of-fact, devoid of any remorse or humanity. His gruesome descriptions of his murders were so detailed and graphic. One officer asked him to elaborate on what exactly he had done to one of his victims. Golovkin responded, and quote, Bring your son down here, and I'll show you. Ultimately, he admitted to murdering 11 innocent boys and teenagers. However, 
During the time Golovkin was active, over 50 boys and teenagers had gone missing. But Golovkin ceased communicating after his confession to the 11th murder. There was speculation that his true victim count could be much higher, but he seemed satisfied with the notoriety his crimes had earned him, and even welcomed the prospect of receiving the death sentence. In his words, such punishment would be, and quote, ideal. During Golovkin's trial, it was decided that the parents of the victims wouldn't be allowed to attend. The concern was that hearing the gruesome details of their offspring's last moments would be too traumatic. Golovkin's testimony was equally horrifying. He stated that it was through these vile acts that he understood what love was. He claimed to derive pleasure from his sense of dominance and power over his victims. Golovkin appeared to show no remorse for his actions. He told a psychiatrist that after each murder, he felt a pleasant sensation, as though he had done something good and fulfilled his duty. His understanding of his actions was utterly distorted. In a chilling admission, when questioned why he had never started a family, Golovkin responded, and quote, I was afraid that I would do the same with my son as I did with these boys. Golovkin's life ended on the 2nd of August, 1996, marking a grim end to a life marked by heinous acts. He was executed by a single gunshot to the back of his head, a method of execution typically used in the Soviet Union and its successor states. Golovkin's execution holds a peculiar place in Russian history, as it was the last time a death sentence was carried out in the country, before it decided to abolish capital punishment. While Golovkin's execution did provide some closure to the horrifying saga, the pain and the trauma that he inflicted not only on his victims, but on their families and the entire community. This is one of the worst cases I've ever covered and it will be felt for a very long time. That's the end of this episode. Until next time, stay sane.